This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, brought to you by the Israel Democracy Institute, an independent center of research and action dedicated to strengthening the foundations of Israeli democracy. Before we start, we'd like to ask for a special request. Please consider joining our community of supporters by giving to our Patreon campaign. You'll find it on our homepage and we'll give you the details at the end. I'm Dalia Shenlin. And I'm Gilad Halpern. Every week we'll be talking about books and research and other things that have caught our attention. Our guest today is Dr. Gilad Malach. He is the director of the Ultra Orthodox in Israel program at the Israel Democracy Institute. He's a public policy scholar. He has studied the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel and has participated in drafting of several policies and policy papers on the matter. Dr. Malach is in charge of the Statistical Report on Ultra-Orthodox Society in Israel, published annually by the Israel Democracy Institute. Dr. Gilad Malach, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Hello, thank you. So virtually the most influential attribute of the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel is their high birth rates. That, even though they've gone down slightly in recent years, but they remain significantly higher than the rest of the population. Now, since I became politically aware, which is about 25 years ago, but I'm sure it, it had existed before, there's been a talk of an imminent Haredi takeover, right? Any minute now, they're going to be a demographic majority and they're going to take over the country. Yet, it seems like that over these 25 years, little has changed in that respect. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with the people who say that? Where are we standing on this? Let's say, first of all, that things has changed since, uh, let's say, uh, beginning uh, 90s, 1992, something like that. The ultra-Orthodox society was around uh, 350,000, something like that. And today there are more than 1 million. So... They grew up and they grew up rapidly. It is connected to the fact that uh, their birth rates are very high, around 7. It was a bit more than that. It was 7.5, but it's... you Ch- or, Children per family, per household. Yeah. As an that, average, yeah. that's yeah. the most important average. part. Yeah, I mean, there is maybe one state in the world that you have such high rates. It's Niger, South Africa. But... At the Western world, you don't have even something close to three. And the score in the Western world is Israel, which is the the average here is three. So the ultra-Orthodox are a bit more than two times than the average. So they are growing more rapid uh, than the, and, the, and uh, the old population. Well, let's just, but just to, keep, to get the context for Gilad's question, as a portion of society. Okay, they're growing, but then so is Israeli society is growing. So I think the numbers you have here, you chart a rise of 9.9%, let's say close to 10% a few years ago, to 11.75, so nearly 12% now. I think that compares 2015 to now. In other words, there's still only 12% of the entire population. If you calculate the adult population, it looks like they're around 8%. So why do we have such an exaggerated image of an imminent takeover? And are they stable at that rate, roughly? Yeah, I can add to the fact, I mean, they are growing, but there are some uh, reasons why we don't see it, for example, and the the politics, meaning that they have more mandates or something like that. First of all, we have the phenomenon that at the 90s and even a bit more than that, one million immigrants made Aliyah and came to Israel, especially from the... Soviet Union. Yeah, the Soviet former Union. Soviet former Union. Soviet Union. Even though there are only about three quarters of a million of them left. Less than that. <laughs> no, no, less than Even that. Even less. So this is one reason, and especially the immigrants, most of them were elders, so meaning that all of them voted for the Knesset. So in the balance, the parliament, we see that they are limited. I mean, they grew up. They grew up from around four mandates, to six mandate if I refer to one political party. And the other political party, we see very interesting phenomenon because Shah's party at the late 90s was around 10 mandates, 12 mandates, and even more than that. Famously, 19, yes. 17, yeah, yeah, yeah. 1999. The, the peak was 17. Now they have just seven mandates. But the reason it's not connected to the growth of the Haredi society, but to the fact that 
uh, 15, 20 years ago, they had a lot of supporters that weren't Haredi ultra-Orthodox. They were, were Masorti, traditional, or others. And now they are focusing just on the uh, Haredi voters, so they have less mandates. Is there no, no significant dropout rate? Right? I mean, are they, every baby that's born a Haredi or, you know, by and large ends up a Haredi adult? You are focusing now on another point. We know that years ago, it was almost like this, meaning 99% of the population, people who grew up as ultra-Orthodox, remained ultra-Orthodox when they became adults. Nowadays, we see that there are more dropouts, more people who prefer not to continue to be in the community, it doesn't mean that they will become secular. Some of them will be traditional, others will be religious, but modern religious. But still we are talking around 10% of the population. But it's more than 2% of the population that was... When was it 2%? We have some details about 90s, and it was less than 5%, okay? So we see a growth in the percents of people who leave the community. We oh, also... the, are you talking about the people who leave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Their number or their, their percents are growing. The percentage yeah, of people it. who leave are growing. So yeah. just to clarify, I also want to correct what I said before. That rise of 9.9% to 11.75% of Haredim in Israeli society was over the last 10 years, not over the last few years. So that's a pretty slow rise in a way which does seem to contradict this high birth rate. But now you're explaining that there has been a corresponding rise in the percentage of people who leave. I don't think that this is the main explanation. The main explanation is that although they are growing rapidly, in 10 years, 2%, meaning that they, I mean, when you compare it to the whole population of Israel, that also grows rapidly if you compare it to the whole world. So it takes time. I mean, people sometimes see the data and they see that the average Haredi women will have seven children and the average women in Israel will have three. So they think that in 10 years, the Haredim are going to be the majority. No, even if the situation won't be changed, but I believe that it will be changed. But even if if it won't change, it will take maybe 50, if not more than that, years until the Haredim will be 40% of the population. Okay, so that raises even a broader and more interesting question, which is whether their lifestyle is sustainable at all. Because if there's such an, an insignificant dropout rate, it means that those families somehow, you know, continue living the way they do. And while we, secular middle class Israelis, can barely get by to make ends meet. I mean, what does it say about the Haredi who live in abject poverty? Yeah, this is the point regarding to projections, demographic projections, that we are looking at a specific point right now, and we are talking about things that will happen in in 30, 40 years, and our assumption is that nothing's going to change. But the point is that since the beginning of 2000, the policymakers, and also even within the Haredi community, there are more and more awareness that we are in a big, big problem or challenge. So this awareness results changes in policy, in behavior, and there is a good chance that these changes will lead also to other results regarding to their growth. Well, I think the the question that arises so in, in such an interesting way from the report or the observation is not just about the chances that their lives will change, but the fact that their lifestyle and behaviors are already changing. Exactly. And one of the most interesting ones that you note is that there has been an increase, a hundred, 150% increase between 2010 and 2016 in the last six years of people studying for an academic degree. Why is that happening now? And let's talk about the impact too. Yeah, the point is that, as Gilad mentioned, it is not. It wasn't their lifestyle or their behavior wasn't sustainable, and the state had at the late nineties. The state had to support more and more the ultra orthodox society in order that they will survive, but it didn't help them. I mean, at the middle nineties, the poverty rates. 
I mean, Haredim under the poverty line were around 30%. And at uh, 2003, they were more than 50% under poverty lines. And in those years, the state supported more and more. Even, for example, if we give a very important example, the children allowances, the state doubled, almost doubled the support at those years, but it didn't help anymore. So... The, state, the, the sum total of support that they gave to, or, or per the child, the child, child subsidies, per, yeah, the child subsi- tax breaks, yeah, the subsidies, the ultra orthodox, because of their poverty, their political leaders made pressure that the the subsidies will double itself, especially for kids number five, six, seven, the more and kids, more, the more which are the ultra orthodox. But didn't kids. that didn't wasn't that rolled back in the early two thousands? The point is, yeah, at two thousand and three. There was an economic crisis and the Israeli government had no choice but to make a great cut in the allowances. And this cut affected the ultra-Orthodox behavior until nowadays. And who would have been the finance minister who was responsible for that? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Mr. Benjamin <laughs> Netanyahu. Yeah. People are going to leave the, the show thinking that I'm a Netanyahu supporter yes. is what it comes down to. Yeah. No, but, affa- but affecting impact, them no. to this day in what way? I mean, yeah. uh, uh, what was the immediate impact in the long term? I can say that the, the state, those years, started to understand that we have policy challenge and we need to handle with it, let's say, by sticks and by carrots. The stick, the main stick I mentioned, especially children allowances, but not just these allowances, but this was the main support, but also with carrots. And carrots, I mean, especially helping uh, Haretim to enter to the labor market, but giving them support, meaning building spatial frameworks for Haredim in order to make the process more easy for them, building spatial a framework for higher education, and that, Dalia, refers to your question, why the numbers grew up so rapidly. It is connected to the right framework for them. It was easy for them. So it's something that was provided to them by the state. It's not just their willingness to explore and to, you know, go out and acquire higher education, but it's also the state providing them with the Yeah, on one hand, they had more pressure, inner pressure to do it, especially economical pressure. But on the other hand, the state built the relevant tools in order to to make it more easy for them. It's not just the fact that it was uh, separate, uh, special for well, gen- orders, gender segregated. Yeah, yeah, and also and also some uh, stipends and some other supports to make them to go forward to enter to the labor market. So, in other words, the state has been getting involved not by giving them handouts by encouraging them to be integrated into the workforce and education systems without having to change their ultra-Orthodox lifestyle. Yeah, it was very important in the government uh, policy. We don't want to change your life, but we want you to work. And we don't want you to teach you what to think, but you need to be prepared uh, to the 22nd century. So and it, it works. I think that it works. But but some aspects of the lifestyle have changed. For example, the drop in birth rates is that connected to that? You think? Exactly. I mean, the point is that, on one hand, the state gives them opportunity to keep their lifestyle in general. But on the other hand, of course, that you can't compare lifestyle of of somebody who studies in yeshiva all his life to lifestyle of somebody who goes to work. And sometimes if he goes to work, he meets other people, it affects him. But the point is that I mean that according to the, the governmental policy, you can go to work, you can go to higher education and remain ultra-Orthodox. Of course, you will be a, di- a bit different. Maybe you will be more ultra-Orthodox, more like in the United States. The United States being the beacon for how to be ultra-Orthodox and be integrated, even though not all those communities are so integrated. No. But I want to ask you something that does seem to be changing about the more conservative and traditional aspects of this community is really the most fascinating trend of integrationism is among women. I mean, you have interesting stats here. You say that 51% of women are passing high school matriculation exams, much more than the rate of men. 69% of all Haredi 
higher education students are women. And I think the most interesting that I found was that there's a higher rate of internet usage among women. What is going on among Haredi women? The point is that their uh, beginning point is much higher than the men. Why? Because the men in this community had to study Torah, religious studies, basically most of their life, but the women doesn't need to. So historically, it was very interesting. The point was that Men continued to study religious studies for a lot of years. So somebody, beside the support of the state, somebody had to finance the family. And the role was women's role. So they had to study high school and to study secular studies and sometimes matriculations. And also after that, when the ultra-Orthodox family had to get more money from their salary. So who had more opportunity or more for whom it was more easy to go to higher education for the woman because she was more close to that. But it's very interesting that you say that the woman starts from a higher position for that reason. Do you think that if there was an ultra-Orthodox person sitting here, they would put it in those terms? Wouldn't they say that studying Torah is the higher position? Or is that changing? I think that as an ideological point, for sure, this is their belief that studying Torah, that's the best and that's the most important thing. And sometimes even they say the women goes to work in order to finance somebody who study Torah. But this is, of course, what people say and this is the ideology. But the reality is changing. And for example, we saw that, for example, when he analyzed re- answers about How do you understand your work, your job? Do you refer to it just to a way to earn money or as a career? And we saw that most of the ultra-Orthodox will say, we just want to earn money for our living. But youngsters are saying, we want to do a career. Men and women. Men and women? Men and women, yeah. Yeah, and it means that youngsters are not belonging anymore to the concept just studying Torah and, and uh, just go to work just if you have no other options. So doesn't that spell the end of the Haredi lifestyle? What's the point of living a Haredi lifestyle if you don't dedicate yourself 100% to studying Torah? If I understand it well, also, or also this belief that you don't worse anything just if you study Torah, it is also a new understanding of being Haredi. I mean... If you, for example, as I mentioned, compare it to other places in the world, I mentioned the United States, but you also have ultra-Orthodox in in Britain, in Belgium and other places, and they are used to, they are go to work, they have in most of their schools core curriculum and things, secular studies, things like that. And also in Israel, until the 70s, most of the Haredim went to work. So it was a new phenomenon. And because of the needs, it is changing. Do we know why that changed in the 70s, that their sort of value system changed to favor people not going to work and studying Torah all their whole lives? I think that one of the main reasons was connected to the army, to the conscription, because the law says that everybody needs to go to the army, but if you are studying Torah, you can postpone it. But if you stop to study Torah, you need immediately to go to the army, even if it was at the age of 24, 28, 32, until the age at those years, it was 54. So people had to study more and more Torah. So that's a very neat segue into the next point, which is the growing numbers of young Haredim joining the army. Whereas you can say that, you know, going out to work is, you know, answers some sort of a necessity, right? They need to make a living. And some of them even say that it's just livelihood. It's not a career. Joining the army doesn't have that really immediate purpose of making ends meet. It's, it has, you know, ideological undertones to it. How do you explain the, the huge rise in the numbers of Haredim joining the army? I can uh, define between two kinds of Haredim who goes to the army. We have uh, very youngsters that goes to the army at the age of 18, 19, up to 20. Some of them are not exactly Haredim anymore. I mean, these are the 10% of the dropouts. They, of course, go to the army. Others understand that they are not uh, connected 
to studying Torah, they don't like it or they are not good at it. And they say to themselves, we don't want to spend a lot of years in that. And when the state builds the right, the relevant frameworks for the Haredim, and they, they say to themselves, we can serve in the army and we can continue to be Haredim. So because of that, they are coming in growing numbers. This is most of the people who goes to the army. But also we see that maybe 25-30% of these numbers are people who go to the army at the age of 22, 24, 25. These are people that most of them are already married and they are joining the army. First of all, they are positive to this idea, but they are getting trained in some jobs in the army. They are serving in technology and things like that, computers. So they are studying a profession and they are serving in the army this profession and then they go to the free market. But of course, the army influences them to be more connected to the state and to contribute to the state, to meet other people. Does that mean that there's uh, perhaps less um, opposition within the more conservative circles in Haredi society towards the idea of integration, that Haredim don't really have to choose anymore between either integrating into the larger Israeli society and maintaining their lifestyle, that the two can be reconciled? I think that the fact that the whole Haredi society moved toward integration, and we see it. I mean, for example, if we look at the numbers of uh, Haredi at the labor market, the percentage. It was at 2003, it was for men, it was 36%. Now it's 51%. For women, it was 56%. And now it's 73%. So there are great changes. Dalia mentioned the fact that in the higher education there are 10 times than 2003. And of course, as Gilad, as you mentioned, in the army, we see thousands every year that goes to the army. So the whole society has changed. But on the other side, we see some groups within the Haredi community that are saying, what's going on? It is dangerous. And these are these groups are fighting against... These are the Mitnagdim. <laughs> yeah, the, it's called the Peleg Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem fraction. They are doing the demonstration against, uh, against the, the army. draft. Yeah. yeah. And so there are people who are against it. And there are some things, I mean, I can tell you that serving in the army still is not in the mainstream. But higher education, it's much more common now, of course, much more common than 10 years ago. But you raised lots of two very interesting things that I want to ask. I'll try to separate them so I don't pile them on for you. But one is, you know, we're all kind of celebrating this integrationism into Israeli institutions, and it sounds like a great thing on the face of it. But you have mentioned that to do that, the institutions have had to adapt frameworks to allow them an entry point. Are we really going to see the, the, this wondrous integration of Haredim into Israeli life? Or are we, are we going to see that previously secular institutions will have to adapt themselves so much to accommodate them that they will no longer be comfortable for secular life? And I think the easiest example of this is gender segregation. Are we going to see more gender segregated classrooms in universities, more insistence on army units not integrating the genders, et cetera, to the point where even if this is a good trend for them participating in the economy, it does still make life harder for secular Israelis or non-Haredi Israelis? I call these systems, these frameworks, as an uh, integrative enclave, meaning that on one hand, it is enclave, it is a segregate place for, for the ultra-Orthodox, but, Orthodox. but on the other hand, while being at this segregation enclave, you are in a process of an integration. Why? Because, for example, if as a Haredi I'm serving in the army, although it is a one-sex unit, but I have commanders who are not Haredim. If I'm studying higher education, I have teachers and also, of course, the profession that I study, which is not ultra-Orthodox. And sometimes it is a great challenge for me to hear things not from rabbis, but from uh, secular professors. This is one thing. But And another thing is, after being in this framework, you are integrated in the general labor market. And the general labor market, it is mixed. And in this place, you meet everybody. So although there is a price, of course, there is a price for this segregation, but on one hand, we have, I think that we have 
no choice, but on the other hand, it is a process of more integration in the labor market. I see. And the other question, though, that this raises is exactly the resistance, the mitnagdim, the ones who say, oh, we can't, we, you know, the backlash. And I think it's beyond just, is there a backlash against serving in the army or national service? It's, it's behavior that we hear about that is very extreme in any case, segregated, gender segregated sidewalks and buses. We hear about the Taliban moms who, you know, dress like completely covered practically in burqas. Harassment of even religious kids in Beit Shemesh just for not being modest enough at their level. Is this a new phenomenon, this particularly extreme manifestations of their religious practice? Is it possibly a backlash to some of this integrationism? Or is it just something that's like a, you know, idiosyncratic, funny thing that's always been with us in Israeli society? I think that sometimes uh, an extreme phenomenon gets our attention. And people, I think that in some way, there is a great threat. The ultra-Orthodox, most of the Israelis now became... Haredim, meaning they are they are now afraid from uh, oh, the gross... Haredim. Yeah. Our, our English-speaking listeners may not know that the word Haredim means to tremble in fear. So a lot of Israelis, secular Israelis, now are afraid from the ultra-Orthodox. So any spatial event or phenomenon like the Taliban women or something like or, that... Or, for example, just recently, the flight that was on its way from New York to Israel, which was a little bit le- late taking off, and the Haredim on the flight said, oh my God, we're going to land... Well, they didn't say, oh my God. <laughs> but they said, we're going to land on the Sabbath, the and they caused a riot, and they harassed the, the uh, steward and stewardesses. And other passengers uh, were outraged and detained because they ended up having to land in Athens and wait for two hours, and they kind of ruined it for everybody else. So, again, I, I just that example popped into my mind yeah. because it's so recent. But, I mean, are we going to see more of this, or is yeah, it just I mean, going to always be The there? point is that if you are in a fear, you behave more tight. So, uh, for years, we saw it even from the Haredim. The fact that we mentioned that at the 70s, they were more in afraid, so... They made more deepened enclaves, and that was their behavior. And so now, sometimes from the secular side, we see that there is an afraid of their growth or thing, or, or their political power or things like that. So sometimes even an extreme behavior, they get, you know... Yeah, because maybe conversely, you can say that they feel more comfortable in their own skin, so to speak. So they, you know, they rise up and are more vocal about their needs than they were before. You can say that, that in some way, the fact that they are bigger... In their cycles, they are talking about that we have, even now, when we are bigger than the... We have to change our behavior. We need to be more response, to take more response in general of the state of Israel. And this is a good development. So I think on one hand, it is sometimes it is at the edge. But on the other hand, some of uh, the demonstrations against the army, it is because the fear that... We see that so many people are joining these phenomena, these new phenomena, want to integrate. So we are afraid that the whole structure of the Haredi society will be changed. So some people are demonstrating against it. Do you think that, you know, taking into account all these trends and the changes to the lifestyle and everything that we were, were talking about here, can we already talk about a social class that is perhaps modern ultra-Orthodox, or is it too soon? We made, uh, I think it was very interesting research. And in re- this research, we started to portray the Haredi society in a different way than the common way. Because the common way is to say that the Haredi society has three fractions, three tribes, let's say, the Hasidic, the Lithuanian, and the Sephardic. But we tried to analyze this society according to their attitude to modernity. And we discovered that 40% of this society have some elements of modernity. What kind of elements? Some of them we mentioned, like uh, studying in higher education. Others are like using the internet and uh, uh, or reaching or wanting to have some middle class behaviors in their lifestyle, for example, going abroad in the summer and things vacation like that. Vacation rates. You yeah. measure vacation uh, rates. Yeah. quite interesting. So we see that 40% has some elements, but just 10% can identify themselves as modern. 
10% say we are modern or ultra-orthodox. But we see that if you take this 10% and these more 30% together, there are 40%, we are talking about maybe almost half of the, the Haredi society that made some changes in their lifestyle. And if you add to it another phenomenon that I didn't mention until now, the fact that the power of the spiritual leaders weakened. How do you Ten, measure that? Ten, uh, it's hard to measure it, but we know that 10 years ago, the Lithuanian group has rabbis, one rabbi who lead the whole community, and he passed away, and there is no one rabbi for, for this community. So the result is that more people decide for themselves what to do. Because if there is one somebody who holds the whole community, it's hard to make uh, your own decision. But if there are a lot of rabbis, you choose for yourself. And sometimes you will say, yeah, I got I'll the right permission. I'll choose the rabbi yeah. who lets me do this. Well, we can't possibly end this conversation without my asking the $64 million question, which is what is this going to mean politically? Is this increasing integrationism possibly opening their minds towards voting outside of the Haredi parties? Will the Haredi parties retain or lose power as this integrationist trend is possibly offset by s d population growth? And maybe the Haredi parties themselves taking a more proactive line on national issues rather than taking after their own community. Or the opposite. Will more Haredi vote for other parties, but then sort of bring in their Haredi lifestyle and you know their way of living will influence the rest of society? And I'm not trying to ask this judgmentally. I'm really... Just curious yeah. what you're at. I, I will say a few things. First of all, as we saw at the last 20 years, we don't see the, in our projections that in 10 years, the strength, the power of the political, Haredi political parties will be much more than it is today. Maybe two more mandates, something like that, More, not more than that. This is one thing. Another thing, we saw at the last uh, municipal election, which was uh, two, three two weeks, weeks ago, ago yeah. yeah, we saw some new phenomenon regarding the behavior of the Haredi voters. One thing that we saw, we saw the fact that this fraction, these uh, tribes within the Haredi society doesn't succeed in all, in all uh, cities to get an agreement between themselves. And for example, in Jerusalem, there was a great battle between them. So there is a chance that it will also continue to the national level. And even in the national level, the Yadut Torah, United the, Torah Judaism, yeah, won't succeed to continue as one party. So there might be an effect to that. This and, is one thing. And we should also remember that in Beit Shemesh, of course, the Haredi candidate did not win incumbent, right? Wasn't he the incumbent? He didn't mm -hmm. win. And a woman, a modern Orthodox person, won instead. Did she win Haredi votes? Yeah. And this is the second point that we see more people... I believe most of them are from the modern Haredi that we mentioned, but also in Bet Shemesh we saw it also from others, that I can call them independent voters. People who say that, of course, we are Haredim and we support Haredi power, but if we believe that somebody else will give us more help, more assistance, we don't support the Haredi party or the Haredi nominee. So... We will see, one thing, there is a chance that we will see ultra-Orthodox uh, nominees in other parties, not in the Haredi parties, in the Likud party, maybe in the Labour party, maybe in the uh, Bayit UD, Jewish Home uh, party. We will see them there. There is a chance that uh, the daughter of Harav Ovadia Yosef will also join a secular party. And if I refer to the voters, there will be more voters that will say, we don't support anymore the classical political Haredi political party, but other other parties. But nowadays it is maybe 15 percent of the voters. Maybe in five, 10 years, it will be much more than that. Well, we're well, looking at some unexpected changes yeah, stay in with Israeli us. society. Yeah. Watch this space. Especially if you consider that for, as Gilad has pointed out, 20, 25 years, if not more, there has been a general fear campaign that Haredim are going to take over our lives. Yeah. Demographically, culturally, and maybe it's not quite that simple.
All right, and on this note, we'll have to leave it. Uh, Dr. Gilad Malach, the director of the Ultra Orthodox in Israel program at the Israel Democracy Institute. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And many thanks to Gizem Ozdemir, our sound engineer, uh, Itai Shalem, our producer, and the Israel Democracy Institute for the generous support. And now we've got a request. Many, oh, most of you, listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app, and we would like to ask you this. Please consider writing us a review. Just launch the app, select our podcast in the library section, scroll down to ratings and review and then press write the review and of course write one. And don't pretend you can't write. We know you're a pretty literate bunch. And you can support us by going to our website. That's tlv1.fm slash Tel Aviv Review and subscribing onto our Patreon campaign. We've got gifts and other perks for you. Check out our archive with almost 500 interviews. Uh, if you like what we do here, you can also like us on Facebook. Our page is called the Tel Aviv Review Podcast Ideas from Israel. And don't forget to follow me and Dahlia on Twitter. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, from Dahlia and from me, goodbye. Goodbye.